<laughs> right, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to you all. And if it's not a little bit late to say Happy New Year to you all. Um, here we are hurtling through February or January into February already. Can't believe it. Anyway, um, it's good to see you all back um, here at Queen's and to those online, you're also very welcome. Uh, usual housekeeping rules, please, if you can make sure that your mobiles are turned off both in the lecture theatre here and at home. And if you could have your mics off if you're online, please. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm sure John will take them at the end uh, and those online can put them in the chat function and we'll deal with them at the end of the talk. So uh, before I introduce this, uh, this evening's speaker to you, I have uh, a few general announcements to make. Uh, firstly, next month we have our AGM on Monday the 26th of February, which will be followed by a slideshow of events from 2023. Uh, as always, we'll be electing officers and members of the General Committee. So if anybody would like to put their name forward or to nominate someone with their permission, of course, then uh, please do so uh, to the Honorary Secretary uh, by the 19th of February at the latest. And uh, I would like to stress that we really would welcome any paid up member who would like to seek election and join us in decision making and planning of activities in the UAS. So please do consider joining us if you would like to. And speaking of paid up members, uh, may I politely remind people that subscriptions for 2024 are now due, or dare I say even a little overdue. So if you haven't paid your subs yet, uh, could you please do so as soon as possible? Um, our honorary treasurer, Lee Gordon, is there. He would be quite happy to accept hard cash or checks, or if you wish to pay um, online by PayPal, uh, that's also very acceptable. Um, could you also... Um, Oh yes, uh, <laughs> he's waving the, the newsletter. The, the uh, winter newsletter is now available. So if you would want to pick up your copy now rather than wait for it in the post, um, he'd be happy to uh, give it to you and just we'll sign your name off on a list there um, and get those at the uh, end of the lecture. Uh, can you also please um, ensure that we have your um, most recent um, email addresses and uh, con all your contact details. Um, as you know, we lost our honorary secretary in the middle of last year, and we have been slightly struggling with um, getting our membership lists um, pulled together. And certainly I think we found that some people's are out of date. So if you haven't been getting information, or if you're a new member and you want to check that you're on the list, then please do uh, contact us to make sure that we have your, your current details. Um, for those who ordered back copies of the uh, Ulster Journal of, uh, of Archaeology, um, which were going free, um, th there's um, some have been set aside if you've already put your orders in and they can be collected at the end of the lecture. Um, if you're interested in putting in an order for, uh, for any back copies, if you could uh, maybe contact um, us maybe through Duncan and uh, Barry, who's uh, got the, the stash hidden away, will um, make up the orders and arrange with you for collection. But it is strictly by collection, we're not posting them out. But they are free and uh, certainly if you want to add a few to your collection, you're very welcome. Okay, so uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce um, our speaker this evening, Dr John O'Neill. Uh, John's a graduate of Queen's um, with his honours degree and PhD in archaeology and he's held, held roles as a researcher and lecturer uh, both at Queen's, the UCD and various other academic establishments. He's extensive experience in Irish and European archaeology, uh, especially in the late prehistoric period, both hands-on and in management positions both in public and private excavations uh, in all sorts of different environments, including urban, wetland and built heritage. And uh, at, on such sites as the Drumclay Cranog, um, a senior archaeologist and research manager for IAC Archaeology. Uh, he, he's previously been on the UAS committee and, and is still on the editorial board for the Ulster Journal of Archaeology widely published on a number of subjects, both of archaeology and uh, more modern history. So um, 
it's with great pleasure that I hand over to John now for this evening's uh, lecture at the Valley of Dry Bones. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, thanks Danny. Um, it's always great to be talking to Saturday. Um, so um, I, this lecture is gonna be slightly different in that you're gonna, next time you go around Belfast, and I assume most of you are very familiar with Belfast, you're gonna feel slightly different about parts of the city. Um, it, that might sound like a bold claim, but once you've kind of seen all this, you'll understand what I mean. Um, First, I have to kind of give a bit of context to this. Um, I had back, I'd say it must, it must be more than 15 years ago, in a previous volume of UJ, I had looked at some of the medieval finds from around Belfast city centre. And I was kind of familiar with, there's a passing comment in it, uh, Canon John Granger, who was kind of well-known antiquary in Belfast in the mid 19th century. He was discussing a burial that was found in High Street that I was mentioning in this article. And I know and he, I, he notes in it that it wasn't an executed prisoner. And his, his explanation for this is that the regular place for such internment was at the long bank behind Ann Street. Now, I had a, I obviously had read this before and, quote, and it was in the back of my head somewhere. Um, and it kind of hadn't really come back to me in a long time until I was looking at uh, the market area of Belfast was sort of developed by Edward May in the in early 19th century. There was a 200 market 200 project that was looking at sort of the history and heritage and everything of the area. And as part of that, I was looking at, when I was looking at it, Fenton Hargy and the Market Development Association had just sent me this quote and said, oh, you know, have you ever seen this in the Ulster Journal? This was... Uh, Bigger had written this, um, and it was Henry Purdom was very involved in Belfast Charitable Society, and kind of would have had been very familiar with most of the kind of like key figures in the city in the nineteenth century. And he also mentions you know the burial of many uh, ninety eight, I presume means seventeen ninety eight victims in May's fields, a short distance beyond the termination of May Street. And here was a narrow strip of ground with a row of graves known as the Cropley's Burial Ground. And this was the first time I'd seen anything corroborated. Granger's um, you know, kind of referenced the burials. And so I thought, um, right, I, I thought I'm going to be a smart ass about this, like I normally am. I'm going to sit down, I'm going to look through some of the digital archives and find references to burials, and I find this easily. Because if, if I put in, you know, human bones, skull, various things, and now, I mean, research has changed quite a lot over the last 20, 30 years. So, the kind of creation of huge digital archives of information, you couldn't have gone through 200 years of 10 different newspapers to try and find a reference to something, whereas now you can create digital searches to do all that work for you. So I thought, okay, I'm going to be really smart about this. I'm just going to do that. I'm a cup of coffee and I will mention the Fenton. Yeah, I know where that is. You know, I thought, right, I'm going to be really smart about it. So um, this is really kind of... A, this lecture is my downfall from that piece of, you know, being smart ass. And that's really what all of this is going to be about as I go along. This, the, that is the genesis of all of this, by the way. It is not, uh, there is no kind of, you know, great idea of trying to pull together information on the archaeology of Belfast. Rory's already done that, you know, so why would you go about doing that? And instead, this is a pure happen chance of finding a completely new layer of archaeological information about the city that we weren't really aware of, but we would never have deliberately went looking for. Um, but so you, you have to keep that in mind as we go through this, that um, this isn't some sort of great piece of research. This is pure accident. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I'll explain a little bit about the Long Bank in case anybody's wondering what the Long Bank even is. Um, the, there you know, the very first map I showed is one of those Phillips maps from the late 17th century. And uh, when the Historic Towns Atlas of Belfast was published, they had recently got a copy of uh, what's what can colloquially called the Lennon map, which is dated 1696. And it's clearly based on Phillips survey maps, but has bits more information and labels on it. Now, I don't think anyone has ever seen the full 
map and there may be a key and other information that we still don't even know. But uh, the C bank is, if you think, uh, this is High Street here. You can see the cursor on the screen okay. Um, and if you think of the, the C bank as running down off where Corn Market is and Arthur Street and out that direction, I'll explain a little bit more as well. The problem with this, of course, is that it's upside down. So if you kind of have to think of it sort of north to the top of the page, you know, you have High Street here, Waring Street here. And if you think this is, the, you know, this is the castle, former location of the castle, and the sea bank runs down there. Um, we have, it's called the Long Bank. It's called, you know, there's a few different names that appear for it as features. It features in a number of illustrations. And these are kind of quite interesting because this is Andrew Nichols. It's fantastic watercolor Belfast, or painting of Belfast. But this is the long bank here. See this nondescript looking feature that runs around and you're looking at the formerly long bridge. Um, and there were slightly earlier I'll street, or like various depictions of it from the 1770s onwards. And the reason why I'm showing these is if you look at the long bank in different illustrations, it kind of tells you a little bit more than we kind of known about. I mean, there's not been a lot of focus on this as being an archeological feature. It's believed to have been constructed in the 17th century sometime, though it's not entirely clear when or by who. And you can see it here on Williamson's 1791 map. Um, this is the long bank feature here. This is the view, you see the, the red dot is where the viewer is standing and looking towards, see the long bridge here. So this is Ann Street, High Street would be here and here, and that would be the alignment of these buildings. So this is where the viewpoint is. There's a feature on a lot of these early maps called the Mall, um, which ran down from Lennon Hall down, and we're going down towards um, where Crummock Dock was and Gasworks site and everything is. And the, that is roughly the alignment of Crummock Street. Um, a lot of this a lot of these earlier features are completely lost. Everett May's grid superimposes across a lot of them. But if you look at the street map now, um, there's been sort of post-1970, there's been a lot of redesign of some of the urban landscape. But if you if you look at the earlier 20th century maps, you can see a grid that sets off Crummock Street that May didn't completely obliterate. And even in all of those, you can't find anything that aligns with what would be the long bank, other than the Crummock Street kind of is more or less perpendicular to it. But in these views, uh, illustrations, people often assume this is the lagging. It's not the lagging at all, it's the mill dam in this area here that we're looking at. And it's sort of meandering around. And this is where the long bank runs down here. Um, so this is from Fisher in 1772. There's another illustration that Lawson produced 1789. And you can see the long bank actually starts to disappear into the water. And I think one of the key things about it is this is this seems to be some sort of feature that tends to trap tidal water. So at high tide, the one end of the bank it gets overwashed by the water, and then obviously it runs out to retain some water. It's marked as the former fish pond and various things, and obviously it had some of these uses. Now, whether it was, was originally meant to be some sort of uh, tidal pond, like mill pond, that would then you know function as part of a mill system. Again, it's not entirely clear. Uh, I'm just sort of making a point that these kind of these are things that kind of might be worth exploring now. But there certainly seems viable. I mean, as you can see, that Lawson shows it being partly inundated, and then the next slide is not going to open for me. Uh, then there's a more famous print by John Nixon, which. Is if you look at the game, look at the view here, we're actually looking up towards what would be the end of Ann Street now. But this is actually this embankment. I had originally thought this was the long bank as well, but it looks like there's a deliberate embankment even built on this side as well to accommodate all this. So this seems to be quite a substantial um, embanked area to retain water, whether it's a fish pond or anything else. Now, in my interest in this was I was trying to figure out if some of it's inundated then it limits the areas where you would be looking to try and find human remains of a lost cemetery in Belfast. So I think I'll just skip on from that one. Um, now, there is a, 
It is possible to take the maps of Belfast, some of the survey maps from the end of the 18th century. This is one published in the town book of Belfast, I think of Ben. Uh, and there's various editions of Ben and the town book, and these are the corporation, the town book of Belfast Corporation, and they they both reproduce this, but it's reasonably well measured survey because you, if you even take as a check the distances between like Savannah Street and High Street, and you know you can there are various ways you can check this to make sure that it fits on the map, so you can transfer some of this across. And this is shown where the long bank runs from. You can see where the shambles was at the end of Ann Street, and it runs out across. Now, of course, Victoria Square sits over some of this area now. So this is a transferred on the map. So my, in my uh, foolishness, I thought, okay, right, all I have to do is find something to sit somewhere along this line. So when I kind of did my quick digital searches, thinking this would take me 10 minutes, when I plotted the locations in the city center, um, sorry, I'm jumping too far ahead of myself, I found that there were a lot of places that there weren't supposed to be burials at all. And, that's what I'm going to run through now. Now, as a just quick preamble, um, there are obviously well, there are well documented medieval burial sites around Belfast city. And I'm really concentrating on the city center. Um, I'm not looking on the county down side of the lagging or slightly further feed. This is really just around what became the, the kind of the more established kind of plantation town of Belfast, which is presumably the same location, the medieval borough. Was in. Um, Shank Hill is kind of the obvious starting point. Um, obviously, by virtue of being called the old church, it's obviously been superseded at some point by a new church, newer church. Um, there are a small number of medieval references about to these, but the paucity and the poverty of the medieval documentation around Belfast means even though there's a, a reference to an Ecclesia Alba and the Capella de Vado, the Ecclesia Alba being a white church. Uh, Capella de Vado is the chapel of the Ford. It's usually assumed the chapel of the Ford is the one on High Street, but Shank Hill is also located on the Ford of the a Ford of the Farset, over well, you know what is now the modern Shank Hill Road, um, and even slightly further on the, the city centre side of the Shank of Shank Hill on the Shank Hill Road is known uh, was formerly known as Boar's Hill, and Boar's presumably from Irish Boher which is kind of just reinforcing how this is the, probably one of the main roads out of the kind of crossing point of the Lagan as well. But, I mean, it survives. There is a terrace known as Boar's Hill with a number of businesses in it down towards Agnes Street. Um, so, like, there, there's, I, I think there's a bit of ambiguity here about which one is actually the chapel at the Ford. And neither are the sets of references particularly significant. I mean, it just simply indicates that there's clearly two church sites. Um, it's mentioned in the accounts of uh, some of the De Burgo kind of uh, conflicts uh, at the inter the, the it's the camp or you know the encampment or the settlement at Shank Hill and Carrick Fergus. Um, but it was already in ruins by 1604. We know there's a Boulogne stone there hint and at an even earlier ancestry. And the the graveyard and the burial ground was transferred to Belfast Town Council in 1776. The other chapel of the Ford is obviously the one, the Corporation Church on High Street. Um, there are, I mean, the, you, you can see how even all of the references in 1615, the references all get combined into an Ecclesia de Sancti Patrici de Vado Alba. So it's the White Church at the Ford, you know, the White Church of St. Patrick at the Ford. I mean, I, like, I think if you can go back and look at these medieval references or kind of slightly later references, the Belfast, you'll realize just how uncommitted they are to which particular site we're talking about. But this is the, the corporation church that got rebuilt in 1622. Uh, it was fortified during the Cromwellian period and it's described as a grand fort in 1651. Uh, it's the church known as the Church of Belfast in the 18th century and the English church. It got demolished in 1774 and was replaced by St. George's, um, which is St. George's, which is a chapel of ease for St. Dan's, which was the par originally the parish, but when it was first constructed, it was the parish church of Belfast rather than a cathedral. But it, it has a substantial burial ground around it. And I'm not going to go through the those as part of this today, but 
there are numerous references beyond the modern limits of the graveyard. The burials turn up in various places. So um, it's unclear exactly what the original limits would really have been. The third, not very far from here, obviously, is Friars Bush, um, which appears as Friars Town on a 1570 map. And there are various, so the Capella de Kilpatrick is assumed to be Friars Bush and Ballynabraher as well. Um, there are the, the 1613 Terrier lists. Or, there's a, a number of altitudes li listed for Belfast or for Shankill. Um, like, not all of these are clearly identifiable either. I don't think there are any of the sites that I'm going to talk about, but um, there are there, there's there's a bit more kind of work could be done on some of these as well. Um, Friars Bush itself was extended and consecrated in 1828, and that I mean obviously uh, continued for burial for a considerable amount of time. But this is where I ended up with when I plotted the various burials that I'd found. And you can see where Shank Hill is off the map, where Friars Bush is off the map. And um, none of these are close enough to any of those sites to actually be, you know, like directly connected to them. Um, I had previously published some of these burials and the, like these have been, some of these have been well known around former Belfast Castle. Um, it's possible there aren't, if you, kind of review the kind of any of the historical episodes in Belfast. Belfast is not particularly a common kind of location for major conflicts and fatalities. Um, and historically speaking, um, in, in 1690, it's more typically the scene of soldiers dying from various illnesses. And um, now some of them were taken off ships and buried at Tillysburn. Some of them presumably were buried somewhere in around Belfast. Some of the previous kind of conflicts in about the 1570s and other times, there were surely casualties, but it's not entirely clear in some of these cases if we're talking about somewhere that is maybe a burial site associated with that. But as I am going to go through some of these now, by the way, the red arrow is where the long bank is. So you can see that none of these actually turned up where I'd said, or I assumed that they would turn up to begin with. There is a summary of what I'm talking about and in the context of, I was uh, Alban Purdue at a book on the first great charity of this town, the Belfast Charitable Society. I wrote a chapter on 19th century burial in Belfast and it um, mainly talked about the new burial ground, which was uh, is kind of one of the first of the stylized garden cemeteries. I mean, Per Lachaise in Paris is the one that people take as the kind of classic type site. Um, it's 10 years later than the new burying ground, um, the new burying ground in New Haven and in America, it, it also is later. I mean, it's it's one of the earliest. And in terms of this idea of creating sort of a citizen's burial ground where everyone's buried equally, it's not. You know, people talk of people suggest, or it was kind of quite funny an editorial process. People saying, "Are you saying it's non-denominational?" It's you know, it's not denominational. It's not religious at all. You know, it's. It was just a completely new concept, and we kind of don't um, kind of give that sort of prominence that maybe it should get recognised for. But uh, I had, as part of that, I included a brief summary of some of these. So some of these are already in print, if you're, or there's print version of them. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run through some of the main sites just to show how they're not places that we typically look for and to see what kind of information comes out about them. And one of the things that becomes apparent, and I'll talk about it sort of later on, is they often give you an insight into 19th century Belfast, because a lot of these discoveries date from the 19th century, and you get a sense of, like, the popular reaction to them and, you know, like, official responses, and it's, you know, it's quite interesting just to see what attitudes were towards burial and towards death and everything as part of that. One of the first one I'm going to look at is... Uh, in Waring Street, um, William Morland Co. were uh, basically carrying out works as part of setting up their new business. They were located across, you can see the red dot on the map here, um, because of the first station map, uh, more roughly opposite where the Ulster Bank building was, uh, or, or is in Waring Street. Um, there were two skulls found, one that what was described as a sabre wound, and there were three feet into the clay. This is in 1864. There's no other clear reference to burials present on the site or more human remains turning up. 
Um, now, the reference to sword wounds, you know, does suggest if there is, if it does relate to the fifteen seventies or one of these periods when we know there are there are like one of the limited periods we know there's fatalities in Belfast, it is possible that you know they were killed and there were people who are buried just where they were killed. But if if you actually look, uh, this is a plot of some of the the burials that aren't on that map. This is um, this is the Waring Street site we're talking about here. One of some of the burials that I'd published previously are around Belfast Castle, um, former Belfast Castle. There is a reference to one which was on the other side, High Street, which is kind of outside the block that the castle's in and doesn't seem to maybe be directly related to it. Um, there's another reference in the 1860s to a burial that was found in Francis Street, which is just behind, you know, where Castle Court is. On the Millfield side of Castle Court, it's on that side. And another here, Cooper Street. Now, the reason why I put these all on one map is if you take the line of the Farset River, they are all located along the Farset River. And it's possible that maybe that's what these were actually focused on. It's not the medieval town or the you know, 17th century town at all. You know, we're maybe not looking at these in the right way. Now, the Farset's one of these kind of odd elements of sort of Belfast townscape and landscape that it's, it's not visible, literally is invisible in most places. Like it's been covered below High Street. Uh, as you pass along up towards like where Coach Street is and as you cut across the Devis Street and then you go back up then up towards Shankill Road, it, the forest travels up, uh, goes through up towards into Ardoin. Um, for most of that road, it's culverted. It's not visible anywhere. Um, and it, ha it was, like, there were sections of it that were still open in 1960s, whatever else. But this is actually, I mean, it's possible these burials are all deliberately located at sites that were following the river. I mean, the Shankill Church is on the river as well. And the odd thing about them is that, uh, like, the river itself became a sort of industrial zone. In Belfast, there was a lot of mills and other kind of, you know, like, Businesses set up along the river using the river water. Um, it attracted housing, and obviously, you know, there's migration into the city, and workers come in and they were located along a lot of these areas. In the late 20th century, and a lot of people are familiar with the route of the forest at Belfast, even though they don't realize it, because basically, this is the Peace Wall that was built in 1969, follows the route of the forest, really, from Millfield up not as beyond Cooper Street, really. So for much of the route on the map from about here to here. And when you travel along, if you go behind Castle Court, if you look as you pass the bottom of Devil Street, going kind of, you know, towards Carrick Fergus, you know that if you look at the road in front of you, it dips ever so slightly and comes back up again. And that's where the forest that crosses over there and runs down where Francis Street is here down in behind Castle Court. So these are, there's a, a kind of palimpsest of a landscape hidden in here, if you kind of look for it. And you, you probably, the next time you drive across Millfield and you see that, you probably think, why did I not notice it? It's, it's, it's not a very perceptible dip, but once you look for it, you realize it's there. And that's where the forest runs down. And somewhere in Francis Street, there was a burial randomly turned up alongside that. There's no mention of grave goods at any of these. Um, and... Cahill Burns, as I roved out, you know, which is a kind of collection of articles and things that he'd written about Belfast. There are references to a number of burials. I couldn't match them up to any of the, the newspaper reported burials, so I've left them out of this. He does mention at least one where there appears to be what seems like a blade weapon, like an iron knife or something, which maybe might suggest slightly earlier burial. But if you are talking about people who have been buried who are, you know, may have been killed in some sort of conflict, like in the 1570s or one of these kind of documented episodes in Belfast. It's possible that it is a weapon that they were carrying, were buried with, so it's hard to know without any more information. Now, I had mentioned the three sites that we know of. The Lenin map that I'd mentioned earlier also has a small number of places that are marked that have what appear to be burial sites. One of these... Um, you can see the, 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 these are the marked here on the map. Um, the High Street, 
Corporation Church is the red square at the top here. Uh, the open one is, this is Waring Street, just to kind of put these other ones in context. And then there's three more that are clearly, these are clearly shown crosses and this, you know, clearly indicate burial grounds. Um, I, this will make more sense as I talk about them, why you can believe that they are burial grounds, okay? Well, one of them's called Death Pit, so I think we can possibly take that, you know, as it does what it says on the tin. Now, I just put, you can see where I've drawn a red line and marked it aligned incorrectly here. The problem with the linen map is that it isn't a really faithful reproduction of Philip's survey. Philip's survey is pretty good. If you drop known points onto the map, the points in between, you can more or less, you know, you try and place something against this modern context. It seems to be more or less okay. But one of the problems with the linen map is this is the line in Millfield here. Um, this is Peters Hill. This is North Street. This is the other part of North Street here. So it doesn't, it's slightly wonky in places. And that kind of does cause some problems in trying to identify these locations on the ground. But um, we take this, this is the sort of transferred on the, the Phillips map. Um, if you look, there's nothing remotely, then there's two versions of Phillips map. One shows the buildings sort of slightly isometrically, and then there's the one that's just a sort of 2D survey. Um, the none of these have anything that appears to mark as a building. The only thing, and I'll talk a little bit about some of these and say later on. The, the other map has what looks like a very faint line, which may be a water course over here and runs down where I mean where I've marked Great Patrick Street. Um, now I, the biggest problem for the sites that are marked in the linen map is definitely the Great Patrick Street one. I'll just show you now, just to explain that uh, there are two ways of interpreting the location of this. This is the one I'm talking about that's marked. See the purple square down here? And the red square, it's just this one. Uh, if you look at the locations on Phillips, you can... I think there's two ways of reading this. The old works is the fortifications that around Belfast, the town wall that was built. And if you take that as your reference point, this is shown as the corner of the same, the other corner of the same field. So that would really put that here. Um, these buildings do appear on this drawn. They're clipped off here just for the sake of the size of it. But that would place it here. But if the, you take what becomes the line of Great Patrick Street and um, where you have Edward Street and Gamble Street and Corporation Street and everything down around here, it's kind of very distinctive shape. Uh, that would place it here. That, that's on Great Patrick Street itself. So it's that slight lack of uh, that bad job of transferring Phillips map, the linen map, just causes those couple of problems in this place. So. It's difficult to be exactly certain where the point is that we're looking for with this. Um, that means that there's two potential locations, really. One is on what's now Academy Street, Exchange Street, somewhere in and around here. And then the other is just off Great Patrick Street. This is actually open ground now because obviously a lot of this has been flattened for the dual carriageways and everything else. But um, going through newspaper reports of the various streets and things that kind of proceeded here because the street names have changed quite a bit over the last 150, 200 years. There isn't anything really obvious anywhere in this that suggests human remains were present there. So this is one this is one that can't relocate. Now, you could make the argument that maybe then that's not what they're not meaning to show them as burial grounds. But if you go to the Peters Hill one, which is kind of what I refer to this one as, um, and then you have the death pit, which, you know, does what it says on the tin. Um, it's located slightly further up, um, above uh, above Peters Hill on off the Shankill Road. Um, there are numerous references to burials turned up in Peters Hill. 1859, there's some found in 1864 that are referenced in a slightly later find. I can't find a contemporary reference to those. McGee in 1871. They're in quite specific locations, and there does seem to be something coherent about that. So that's why I would be fairly confident that 
what this is meant to represent on the map as a burial ground. Um, but the like the detail in the Lenin map, it's it just unfortunate that we don't have uh, <laughs> we don't have more of these. Clearly, there was tanning going on along the Shankar Road in this area. The lots of the black pits are that are marked here. Um, there are various other kind of intriguing references to things. Um, there's like what looks like a little small enclosure somewhere there, located behind these buildings. There's quite a lot of interesting things going on, and it's just unfortunate we don't have much more of an art of the ghost with the map itself. The death pit, there is at least one burial was look, was discovered in Townsend Street. Um, most of these are discovered. If you think of when, uh, like a lot of the this area has been built up since the 18th century, if not the end of the 17th century. I mean, you can see in Philip's map, you can see the map here, that there are plots being built. Um, the key kind of events really for some of these discoveries are when gas was being introduced in the 1850s and 60s. And some of these streets were being built out and uh, terraced, uh, terraced houses from maybe sort of like a bit more haphazard cottages along some of the roads. So in Boyd Street, when gas was being introduced in 1859, that was when they, they had some of the burials there, which are part of St. Peter's one. And similarly in Townsend Street, when they were getting rid of some older buildings and they were putting in uh, new housing, there was at least one food burial found in Townsend Street. I presume from the gap between them that the chances are that Townsend Street one is located close to what's being referred to as the death pit. And I think if I was going to commit the one of these being something that we could maybe map the historical event. I would suspect the Schomburg's troops that died of various kind of um, pathogens in Belfast, I suppose, uh, that that may be where the death pit relates to. They may have been brought and buried outside the town limits at the time up here. But, um, the, but the reason for that also is there's what's going on at Peter's Hill seems to be slightly more complicated. Um, Sorry, I've already talked about uh, that. Peters Hill, um, some of the burials are clearly laid out side to side. This is from the, the brief descriptions we get in the newspaper accounts. There's even a mention that some of them are laid with their head next to old foundations that were found when the building's being knocked down. Now, Modern day, and I told you, you will not see Belfast the same. If you're driving over Millfield, you're basically driving over where these burials are. And a lot of people here will regularly drive over Millfield or walk around the area. Um, this is the line of Boyd Street down this sort of really badly drawn. <laughs> uh, it wasn't meant to be a rectangle anyway, but it's actually shown the, the original frontage of Mill Street, oh, Millfield. Um, Carrick Hill, if you think that the city centre side is kind of close to where it originally was, and as you walk across the road, somewhere between the footpath and the middle of the road would have been the original frontage on the side, on the northern side there. <laughs> so if you kind of are trying to place yourself, so if you can see where Boyd Street is here, you imagine there was a food block there, and that's kind of along, I built this up along where the original frontage, that uh, I'm not even sure it's trapezium, but it's it's located across where that was. Um, this was very different in the past. 19th century, there was like Turkish baths in Peter's Hill and some of the photographs of the moon is a lot dramatically different than it was today. But um, Andrew Murr was a grocer, had a shop uh, or a business here. And I say business, I'm not entirely sure if we're talking about what used to be called a huckster shop in Belfast or a full-scale grocery business. I mean, this is how it's referred to in the, the 1850s and 60s. But he's clearly located here. And the main burials do seem to be in this area around here. But um, there are there are multiple burials found over a number, uh, oh, like I said, over a number of different events. Um, some of them that are found in Boyd Street, it's not clear. It's not clearly mapped where they are in Boyd Street. So somewhere along this, this block. Um, these are mentioned. It's mentioned that these are taken and reburied at Shank Hill. Um, I'm kind of mentioning some of these because some of them aren't. It isn't clearly described what actually happens to them afterwards. Um, the in the wider area, and um, this is some of the kind of odd things about this particular site. There is a mention in 1894 in work in Carrick Hill. There was a lot of 
a lot of this area had kind of very, I mean, very poor quality slum housing tenements, um, not built as full scale tenements. I think they're more two story red brick, but this area and down on the, what would it be, you know, the city centre side, Carrick Hill, um, this was kind of seen as being one of the kind of poorer areas of Belfast uh, around the market. Cromick Street would have been kind of seen as similarly poor. Um, so a lot of this is being pulled down and rebuilt in red brick in the 1890s. Uh, up, there was articulated limbs found. That These are some of the reports. There's mentions sometimes in these that other bones are found and, you know, that the more burials have been found recently, things like that, and they don't detail them, but it just means that we know that we're not just talking about an isolated burial. But some of these are found, and it's somewhere in this area here. It's not entirely, it's not very specific where it is. Um, there was locally, I know sort of some people, I, I, I know people live around Carrick Hill, and there was a kind of reasonable folk memory of human remains being found quite a lot. Um, there was supposedly uh, a burial found in a sheet and melt work in, works in Kent Street in the early 1970s. This doesn't appear in Yuja had occasionally um, it would have information on f sort of burials that had been found by in the coroner reviewed in the 1970s, 1980s. It doesn't feature in any of these lists of burials that they'd looked at. So I, I'm kind of, you know, until it's corroborated, just not entirely sure. But there is a report in 1897 of a juvenile burial that was still wrapped in something being found uh, to the rear of Stephen Street again. This is all, this is still in this general area here. That's just slightly off the image to the left. Um, this is a, this is a kind of significant location in Belfast and Peters Hill. I mean, it was, there were, there was bull baiting took place here and furs clearly took place here. I mean, it was a sort of scene for a lot of social events. And in 17th century, it's, this is St. Peter's Walk. It's not Peters Hill, it's St. Peter's Hill. And if you look at some of the earlier references to it, like St. Peter's features quite a lot, but there's no other clear background to this name and where it comes from. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, unequivocally, we have something significant here, some 16th century ecclesiastical church, religious type site or something. That's not really, there's no corroborating finds beyond burials from the site to suggest there's something here. But there do seem to be a lot of things going on. Um, and particularly, you know, you have that sort of development of clean and that kind of folk religious tradition of burying unbaptized infants, particular locations, and whether some of these being buried in Seaton Street is recognised as something that's not survived in any kind of folk or rural tradition to remember. But there are clearly uh, uh, aspects of this that kind of merit a bit more research. Um, personally, the thing that I kind of find quite funny is... Uh, like, I mean, I'd like I'd mentioned some of these already, like St. Peter's Walk and Burials and I don't. Granger talks about the earthworks around the, the sort of the 17th century town wall in Belfast and mentions that some of them survived in Brown Square. And this kind of broader area here is obviously Brown Square. He's a block away from the 17th century town, you know, the, the ditch uh, and, and wall that's built around Belfast. So it's not entirely clear what the earthworks that the Grangers reference and the in Brown Square was the, the name that was given to this whole block normally at the time that Granger was writing. There's also an Abbey Street that appears here and appears in the earliest kind of uh, kind of recording of the kind of the streetscape in the area. So there's not um, often some of the street names you can at least plot their appearance through the town improvement committee that approved the names but it's not really clear where that comes from and if that's an attempt to throw some sort of you know religious connotation on the area as well but there are lots of little intriguing hints of something here that is um, slightly more substantial but the main thing is at least corroborates the 1696 map that there are burials um, present here now going outside of the 1696 map. There are other burials that turned up, and there were a substantial number of these along the foreshore 
which again is an area that's now completely obliterated by reclamation and everything else. So it's not a, it's not, it is, I was going to say, it's not an attractive landscape to look at today. It's pretty brutal to look at today. I mean, at least over the years, the smell has kind of subsided a little bit of the methane and various other gases that are coming out of it. But if you go up Cave Hill or you go somewhere where you've kind of reasonably good vantage point of it, you know, it's not the most attractive looking landscape in the world. But it, Again, that obscures a whole kind of sort of landscape and part of Belfast, and also a kind of quite tragic element of what I'm talking about here. Um, in July 1869, Mary Gunning, who seems to have lived somewhere down along that kind of shore road area, she was out gathering cockles at a place called Beatty's Gut. Now, we can relocate some of this based on kind of some of the circumstantial information that's given on it. Mm -hmm. But she reported finding a coffin that was buried in the sand mud that was held in place by four wooden stakes. Now, over the course of a weekend, uh, the constabulary came out to try and retrieve the burial or the coffin. And by the time they came out, the tide had come in and there was two or three different attempts to actually recover the remains, which they eventually did. I mean, most of, more often than not, any of the remains that are recovered, it's usually referenced that they're taken and reburied in Shankill. Now, I don't know at this point in time how good the records are in Shankill for being able to go, or in, sorry, in Shankill, and uh, the Shankill graveyard, to try and actually go and identify where some of these might be reburied. I'm not sure that would have been well enough documented. But the thing that I thought, the thing that intrigued me about this was I'd, uh, th there's a reference to... Um, various things up on the main road above this that means we can actually place it. And Beatty's Gut is actually, this is an admiralty map showing the channels in Belfast Lock. And Beatty's Gut is this channel through the estuarine mud. Now, the thing that I hadn't appreciated, maybe somebody else has kind of written about this, I just hadn't seen it. If you look at that foreshore of Belfast Lock, these channels through the estuarine muds a line on all the key places like White House and everywhere else where there's like medieval or later medieval settlement in Belfast. And obviously there are the places that you could go in on a boat. And that was, you know, what almost that's your kind of guide point actually to navigate in. But as you get down towards where the where Belfast town developed itself, um, you have this one, which obviously Beatty's got. The next one down is Mile Water River which comes out, which I'm going to be talking a little bit more about. And I had uh, someone ha someone else had kind of given me this name Fenian got for an area off North Queen Street, where uh, it's where Castle Court, or not, not Castle Court, where York Gate, or it's called something else, now, it's in the city side or something, that uh, it's where it was developed and it was formerly Veer Street and uh, a number of other little streets in and around there. And... I had been told, uh, this is like people used to call this, there's a number of kind of names there in that area, Sailor Town, like the Half Bap, which is kind of now the Cathedral Quarter or part of the Cathedral Quarter, and an area that was apparently called Fenian Gut. Now, Dominic, that was sort of explained this to me, he said nobody had idea where the name came from. But if when you look at the first edition Northern survey maps, the next stream down or water course down after the mild water is one that comes down and comes through that exact area. And then comes down. And if you look along where Richie's and other people put some of the earliest kind of ship repair, ship building facilities along that side of the river are co-located where these channels come out. You know, why go and build a dock for doing work in when you actually have one that's ready made as a stream through these estuarine muds? So there's a, a landscape there that kind of relocates very the logic behind or the development behind some of these features. Now, when the newspapers reported what Mary Gunning had found, there was a David McCormick sent a letter, the Belfast newsletter, 31st July, 1869. And he mentions that the place was called Green's Barns and it was set aside part for the internment of suicidal cases who were interred at the high water mark. Now, the odd thing about this is now Green's Barns isn't the name that really features. Greenmount was a house that was further down what was this area here which was really what was known as the Point Fields um, and Mount Collier and, you know, the bottom limestone road, kind of that area. And it's not the area that uh, the Mary, the Beatty's gut seems to be. But um, 
I had went through and looked at a bit more of this, and it's kind of it's quite interesting. There's a I'm, I don't know if something familiar with, with Glenn Patterson's novel, Mill for Grind, No People Young. He used uh, the fantastically named Narcissus Bat, uh, had published recollections, recollections of old Belfast, some in Yuja as well. Um, that, uh, and that's Patterson used lots of these in his novel. And he kind of talks about Greensborn and but this sort of general area. And he says a little further in the game was Ringan's point, which I passed with all the haste I could. That bleak spot uh, being where the town's suicide and unbaptized foundings were disposed of then within sight of my destination. He's talking about going to what was Boyd's public house, which is uh, near the mill. And that's the reference point for Beatty's gut and uh, what Mary Gunning, uh, the coffin Mary Gunning had found. But I went through and uh, looked at some of the maps, and also there is a, there are, there are a number of sites along here. Um, you can see again. I mean, this has all been completely transformed um, by the kind of railway line and the later works, which is why anyone going out to look at any of this now, you're not remotely looking at the landscape. We're talking about any time that these burials were deposited. But one of the references I'd find on um, what's now what was Buttermilk Lane or Lonan and is uh, now Skagney Avenue, um, there's a reference to uh, child's remains being found there, and it looked like it'd been um, deliberately, you know, they'd obviously been <laughs> disposed of there. This is in June 1846. Now, I mean, admittedly, we're talking about famine period, so you know, there's an element of circumstances here that maybe. Can't, can't infer too much from a single burial. But there are people, there's a number of kind of local history groups in around that area of the Shore Road who believe that there is a child burial, like Colleen, located near there, near the bottom of Skagney Avenue. So it is possible that that's what some of these relate to. Um, I had taken all of the, the burials that I'd found and there are references to human remains being uncovered around the docks. Now, the one in 1869 is up here. What would be conventionally, what I would have thought would be more likely to be Green's Barns and Green and Greenmount is located down towards here off North Queen Street. And you can see where all the human remains have turned up. Now, these are, uh, some of them it's possible to be quite specific about where they are because it's during some of the works that the development, different parts of the docks and some of the basins, some of the timber holding ponds and various things. And these are, you know, it's quite intricate, the works that take place there. If you look at each map, ordnance survey map, there's constant change on what happens down around here as you get all this industrial scale development along the channel from the Garmoil and the Lalagan. Um, I, I'm even suspicious that the area that there's an area gets reclaimed uh, by John Thompson and uh, from around 1820, and it's beyond part of Belfast is called Point Fields. It's shown in some 18th century maps. I wonder if some of that was reclaimed, and again, a bit like what's going on in the area where the Long Bank is in the 17th century. Do we have sort of episodes of kind of or <laughs> development in the area around? The urban area around Belfast that we've just not had documented very well. Though they're quite large scale works, so you'd think that they would be there would be sort of better documentation for them. But the mixture of remains that are here includes uh, like there's references to children, there's references to older female burials. Um, the kind of implications some of the others that a uh, couple of these different references to you know kind of this odd treatment of some human some human remains after death. Is related to, I mean, and it doesn't seem to be not just suicide cases, but murder victims and other people seem to receive this sort of alternative treatments. Now, this location on North Queen Street kind of coincides, like I was talking about uh, Beatty's God in these channels, where the where the River Mile water comes out is, I'll just flick back again to the previous slide, I mean, we're talking about down through here. These are all really kind of located around the mouth of the River Mile Water. Now, the Mile Water is another landscape feature in Belfast that, that is mostly culverted over where people would see it. Unless you go into Alexandra Gardens 
or some of the parks. And Alexandra Gardens is probably the best one to go and look at because at the, the sort of the North Queen Street end of it, the mild water runs in a very, it's not like, we're, we're not talking Grand Canyon deep, but it's very steep-sided cut that the, the river runs down in. And that continued down towards uh, where uh, Mile Water Street is off North Queen Street and where the river came out is just down below that. And in that area, it's all been built over by the streetscape. So you can't see anything of it in that area. But it's presumably located three, four metres down below that, five metres, because obviously it was partially tidal. There was a bridge built at, if you continue, if you... If you're driving today across North Queen Street, where you cross over the junction with Limestone Road, somewhere after the Limestone Road, you're passing over what was the Mile Water Bridge. It's mentioned in quite a lot of different sources. There was there was money spent on repairing it in the 1640s, which makes me think there's possibly a medieval bridge that is the kind of you know part of was the original feature there that was continued. This is the road to Carrick Fergus remember from Belfast after all and in the 14th century when the the, the Burgos have a borough there um, if you know you get killed by people going from Shank Hill to Carrick Fergus I presume it's along this road somewhere that that happens um, but as well as that uh, it gets there's a, a brick fort John Thompson who was lived in Mount Collier developed or reclaimed land there's a a sketch drawn of what was called the old fort, which was supposed to be erected in 1690. It was a brick fort that was located here to guard the bridge. Uh, when Thoreau captured Carrick Fergus for a couple of days, they didn't like it and left. When sort of Belfast, the panic in Belfast and the formed the militia, there were supposed to have been entrenchments and other outworks built around this location as well, the guard, the bridge and the Belfast. So it is a kind of, again, it's, completely subliminated below this streetscape. And even then, there's another layer of like the Cable Railway that ran down along this route here. Also, I mean, there's been so many kind of reshapings of this area. It's hard to believe many different things are actually hidden around this little one little junction. But that was located here. And this is seems to be conventionally taken as the northern limits of the town or the corporation. And that seems to be why maybe this is selected as a location for burial. For these, it's going beyond the town limits, and that's why they're located here. But it's another little area that kind of is, um, once you start peeling away some of the layers, it gets quite interesting how much is present there. Okay, now, the, I've kind of finally got the Valley of Dry Bones part. Um, and this is, uh, this is one that doesn't appear in any of the maps. So we've gone through the map locations, we've gone through things, things where we have some historical documentation that seems to you know, reflect what's there. But uh, during, for a bit of background, any of you that don't know it, Royal Avenue as it was, or as it is now, is kind of formed from a couple of different streets. And we're, we're talking about on the, the kind of, we're now talking about the kind of, city of the central library side of uh north street uh, or royal on that part of royal avenue on that side of north north street that was originally john street and again trying to work off some of the older mapping john street the frontage is the the sort of central library side it's kind of located in the same place again and when they decided to widen it to make it into royal avenue they obviously flattened the facades and the buildings along the street frontage on the you know the city center side and then they extended it back and then they rebuilt on what was formerly the rear of those properties so during 1882 two as part of road widening and demolition there were some burials found in 1883 they found burials they also found parts of the north gate for belfast which is located here um during work on the steel and sons jewelers which is located slightly further along. You can see just up here, uh, again, there was burials found. And burials that have been reburied during previous works were discovered in a box below what's now the Northern Bank building. I think it's the Cathedral Quarter. Offices now here. And if you tally them up, there's at least 23 burials, obviously discounting the later ones that get rediscovered. 
in this area. This includes children and included another skull that had a clear blade wound on the skull, I think through the one of the eye sockets that was on display in the, the museum in the 1920s and 30s as a, a Cromwellian soldier. Um, I, I've asked Greer, you know, tried to, the, the museum can't track this down, but obviously it would be quite useful if we could actually discover this because we could actually date this particular one without anybody ever having to do any field work. Um, but the, there's clearly uh, a substantial group of burials in this particular area. Um, what's odd about some of them is that if you look at, uh, like, the, this is what's shown on Philip's map for the area. This is where the gate would have been. Um, there's descriptions of the masonry, which seems quite substantial, where the gate was. And if you stand, because from some of the newspaper descriptions, you can literally, I mean, I've gone and done this, you can literally stand at the corner where they're looking down at the North Street where describes what the masonry looked like there, you know, the kind of quite substantial, thick inner and outer stone face with a puddle fill in the middle. Um, it, it talks about there's some references to some of the burials that suggest that some are articulated and some are relatively disarticulated and they're on wetter ground. And to me, my interpretation of that was that this ditch that runs around fortification that you can see on Phillips here, that some of them, I think, may be burials that have bones that have fallen out, that have been disturbed when the ditch was being dug and they've fallen out, you know, which means that they clearly predate the 1640s, rather than uh, the, the one of the great things about the one of these accounts of it, of the, of the burials, it mentions that the older people all call this the street the Bastion, which was Drawn Street, which of course is, I mean, this is the Bastion that they're, they're taking the name from. Um, and again, I mean, there's a there's a bit of heritage we lose with these things that, like, there's no mention of this anywhere. There's no awareness of this in any of the kind of name of the places down around that part of Royal Avenue. Um, and if you go down there today, and again, you know, if you kind of want to take the transformative outcome from this lecture, when you walk across North Street, the top of North Street there on Royal Avenue, you're obviously walking through where some of these burials were placed. And there's a there was at some well, it was used as the bastion later on, which I suspect is not the case. I suspect these predate the bastion being constructed, but there was clearly a burial ground here. Um, and also when you do that as well, actually, if you stand at that point, and it's something I didn't really, I didn't even, I mean, I didn't even look for it until I happened to be doing this. You actually realize how big an open space there is in front of that junction. And it's worth, and when you, if you are there, just have a look at the, the size of the area around the junction or um, between you know, Royal Avenue, North Street. Um, it, it is actually quite a big area, and that's because this is formerly where the gate and all these various things are. I mean, you can see, if you imagine flattening down the bastion and the ditches and everything, like we were, quite a substantial amount of this space is left there. Now, the other reason why I, I am kind of suspicious about this not post-dating the bastion there's at least one burial was found in, in Richie's place, which is across here. It's diagonally opposite um, from where I'm talking about on the kind of this corner of uh, Royal Avenue and North Street. There is uh, a reference in Durham Works on putting in streetlights. And it says opposite the footpath opposite the Northern Bank, which literally I take to be the other side of the road here, which where John Street would have been that there was human bones found there. Now, the only reason why I'm kind of raising this, and somebody might actually be more familiar with this than me, about 19th century use, the word opposite. Now, this is going to sound a little bit dictionary corner, but um, I, it's not entirely clear in a couple of places where I've seen this used, if they mean the footpath in front of a business as opposed to the footpath on the opposite side of the road. And is it a common usage thing then that we that's been kind of lost? But we are because otherwise, why would you say the footpath opposite the Northern Bank if there's a business on that side of the road? Why not just say what that business is? So I, I don't really understand what the usage is there, and whether 
we're missing, I'm misinterpreting that. We, <laughs> I'm implicating everybody in this. I am misinterpreting that. So if anyone, if anybody has any suggestion about that, I'd be really interested in hearing it. Now, I had one of the things that had come up in this 1882, one, when 80, 1882 find, is there is a reference to this and this part of Royal Avenue and these burials being uh, the, now known as the far famed as the Valley of Dry Bones. Now, I have to hold my hand up and say I had no real idea what the Valley of Dry Bones was. And I went and Googled it, like you do, and discovered this quote from Ezekiel 37, 1 to 10. Now, what that brought to my mind, like Ezekiel and the Bible and biblical reference, actually was the film Pulp Fiction. So I thought this was going to something like apocalyptic sounding or anything else. But when I got the actual reference, uh, it's the hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley and it was full of bones. And he led me back and forth among them and I saw a great many bones in the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. This is uh, Gustav Dore's kind of illustration of the valley of dry bones. Now, even though I've now read several interpretations of what this means, I have to hold my hand up and say, I don't really think I'm in the demographic at the same time. I just don't really understand even what the theology is meant to be referenced. And the thing that one, the one common thing in a lot of the interpretations is that these are people who are waiting to be kind of, you know, um, brought back to life and, you know, sort of resurrected on a day of judgment or something like that. And even looking at the contemporary use of it in 1882 in Belfast, the only thing that reminds me of is, Belfast is probably one of the few cities in the world where people can still make obscure biblical references that to a lot of people that they actually are still relevant. You know, I'm sorry, but I just didn't understand it. But um, the, everyone, even if anyone else here is as commonly assures my uh, lack of theological underpinning in this area, you do actually know what the Valley of Dry Bones is, or you'd be very familiar with this. Because James and John Johnson wrote a spiritual that you all know. And I think it doesn't really work if you think of Samuel L. Jackson, Pulp Fiction, to have him say, damn bones, damn bones, damn dry bones. But that is actually the origin of that spiritual. So um, like you all actually do know what that is. But, uh, but one of the things that, uh, that I thought with the, the kind of that made me kind of, kind of aware of is, you know, how often... Like, and it's a typical thing with heritage and history and archaeology, of course, is it's kind of partially reinvented for contemporary circumstances. The audience in 1882 are reading the Belfast Telegraph or newsletter or whatever else and see this reference to Valley of Dry Bones probably know what the contemporary reference to it were. There were clearly a number of revivalist preachers who had mentioned this because, it, you know, you can see it in the newspaper as something that, you know, features as part of a lecture that they're talking about. So there's obviously an audience that always understand these things, and that's why it's used. And so, you know, these kind of occasional discoveries of things that human remains, you know, become something within the life of the city, and they kind of can be quite revealing about attitudes, like official and popular attitudes at the time of the discoveries. So... One of the things that had struck me as interesting about the, the, the bastion, that last sort of burial site I was talking about, in 1905, human bones were found at the Northern Bank, and these were bones that had been reburied in a wooden box. Um, and when they were rediscovered, it was ordered to just get removed to the Union Workhouse burial ground. And the, the interesting thing about this, uh, like well, not, not so much interesting, but I mean, it's sort of revealing about official attitudes, this is the Union Workhouse burial ground here. This is, uh, you all know where the Union Workhouse is, this is Donegal Road and uh, the, the city hospital complex, whatever at the very back of it. But uh, the railway line was put through the Union Workhouse burial ground. Now, you might think, right, okay, that's a bit odd, but I mean, did the burials extend up to there at the time or anything else? They actually did it twice because they actually put in all of the branch of the railway line through the bottom part of the graveyard. Now, reading the reading some of the, con the kind of contemporary coverage of this, like 
there were people who were clearly aghast at the idea that they had just plugged railway lines through the burial grounds, you know, but it's always implicit in this that, you know, it's the workhouse burials, these are paupers, this is the disadvantage, this is, you know, there's a clearly an attitude of indifference about all of that. But even there's mentions in some of them that there have been complaints that people have been farming the ground in the graveyard as well and digging vegetable plots in the graveyard, you know. So, I mean, the, whereas we kind of assume there would be a very officious attitude towards burial grounds and, you know, the disposal of human remains, clearly that wasn't the case. And this is two different episodes in the 19th century that this happens in with the Union burial ground or the workhouse burial ground. <laughs> and if you kind of read, you know, like, the newspaper accounts, clearly the discovery of human remains, you know, was seen as a public spectacle. So you get like in 1882 in, in uh, North Street and Royal Avenue, you know, it says thousands of people yesterday witnessed the unearthing of each skull or limb. You know, if you had an archaeological excavation, you wouldn't have thousands of people coming out to watch doing anything. You know, there's a, like, clearly these are a, an episode in the kind of, you know, the life of the city when these things happen. And similarly, in 1894, came to the same site during yesterday, the remains attracted attention of great crowds of the passers-by who seemed to enjoy the gas of the exhibition very much. So, you know, it's a, it, it's always kind of very interesting just to read. And, 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 and the, the, the accounts of all of these mention the types of rumours that went around. So, you know, all the discoveries are, are like, there's always press speculation or, or, or you know, it's second-handed. It's subtly kind of you know, kind of presented as the views of onlookers. So, you know, that way the journalist doesn't have to take responsibility for repeating this. It's saying this is what other people say. It. And often it's, you know, they're citing some murderous former residents that lived in the property or maybe somebody that had unsafe medical practices and this is where they're disposed of their victims or all their exaggerated histories of violent conflicts. And like I said, if you look at like 1640s, <laughs> Apart from illness, there's there, there actually there isn't a lot of uh, like conflict fatalities in Belfast over time. More typically, when Belfast was attacked, Belfast didn't say no surrender. Belfast said hello, come on in. So you know there aren't these kind of huge um, you know like uh, military kind of engagements in around the city. And of course, there are other finds that you know, the turnout did not be, they're completely unrelated to what I'm talking about. There's all other kind of circumstances to them. Um, again, just down the road from we are where we are in Shaftesbury Square, in five to seven Shaftesbury Square in, I think it's 1929, um, there was human remains found. Um, that's the newspaper article on the, the one you can see on the left-hand side here. Um, and they were, some of them still had flesh adhering to them. And there's obviously lots of speculation about this. Um, and there was a very simple explanation for it. It had formerly been the resident of Jay Dunham, who was an osteopath. And it was his, obviously, you know, he, it was his teaching collection or his reference collection or for showing patients what he was going to do, whatever else. Mm -hmm. Dunham was an American, he was from Kansas. Then he moved to Belfast in 1902 and he practiced in Shaftesbury Square for years. Um, after a few days, when newspaper reports, somebody just points this out that uh, he died uh, or he moved, he, he actually closed his practice a year or two before he didn't die for another four or five years. Uh, and this is another example, like in, in 1867, just in the middle of all these, just somewhere on this side, uh, again, there's human remains found by a dredging crew in the lag, and a lot of these are found during that sort of types of work. Um, that uh, the human remains was an end. There wasn't often an inquest. Sometimes there were inquests, sometimes there weren't. Sometimes uh, the, the, uh, the an inspector or someone could stop me would say, this is too old. It's not really of any kind of, you know, we're not going to find out information. So, well, but in this case, there was an inquest and it turned out they actually could name the individual. He was called William Toll and he'd gone missing in October 1886. He'd been in his daughter's house in, over in the market district and was walking back to where he lived North Queen Street and he just disappeared. And then about a year later, he turned up. This is his granddaughter, Catherine Toll here. And my, that's my grandfather's mother. So um, I, nobody in the family knew this, by the way. Um, I kind of found this as part of one of these references and I'd asked my mother and she's like, yeah, I mean, it must be the same family, but it couldn't work. And eventually from sort of finding whatever details, it turns out uh, that's who it is. So, I mean, that not all human remains turned up, obviously, are related. And 
there is always the possibility that in all of those different finds and things, there is something related to a murderous former resident or, a, you know, ill practice in the part of some medical practitioner or whatever it might be. But, you know, I think it shouldn't be the default <laughs> interpretation. It's probably the best way of putting it. Um, but, I mean, in Belfast in general, I mean, there were constant historical issues with the burial grounds. Like, High Street was liable to flooding. There were often um, very, I mean, a, 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 it seems to be when it flooded that human remains would get washed out of some of the graves, would be redeposited in places in the burial ground. I mean, it sounds absolutely apocalyptic with some of the descriptions of it, and um, because it was over, I mean, it was overstuffed with burials. Similarly, Shankill, uh, the Shankill graveyard had a constant problem with burials not seemingly being buried deep enough because they were just trying to get so many burials into it as well. So there's there's this constant tension over burials and even the new burying ground that gets opened in the 1790, 1790s um, by 1875 I mean all the plots in it are sold by the 1830s um, even though there's a pauper uh, burial ground within it and everything else but by 1875 there was a court case um, and it's quite interesting because it, it talks about that uh, it's where some of the burials that are on the okay, if you're familiar with the Antrim Road that stone wall that runs along the the right hand side of the Antrim Road as you drive up from Carlisle Circus, that's the top of the new burial ground. That was partly rebuilt, and there were burials that had obviously been kind of either slightly outside the wall or in various various other places, and that was all consolidated. And that wall was built, and a lot of it was tidied up. Um, there are references to in this court case in 1875 towards the end of 1875. They mention how strangers were buried in the area between. There's a, the graveyard wall was inside that, and that's an outer wall. There's a kind of a, a sort of like you know, uh, there's a liminal type space in between the two that's in the graveyard, but not in the actual graveyard. And still, even though uh, the the cemetery or, uh, architecture and sort of archaeologist uh, James Stevens Kerr. He, he talks about, Warpole has this thing about uh, some of the development of like the more civic cemeteries is partly to kind of get away from what it talks about, like the mystical and gothic elements of death. Now, I mean, it's obviously referencing Catholicism and high Anglican practices talking about that because there's a strong trend of Scottish Presbyterianism running behind that. But somewhere within all of that is an attempt to rationalize some of these burial practices of like, you know, sort of treating suicides differently and treating certain types of, you know, groups in society differently by burying them in different places. And so even in New Burying Ground, which is kind of, you know, like it's conceptualized as the way of dealing with all these, you know, like getting rid of the mystical and Gothic kind of practices, even then there's still, you know, suicides are buried and not pro in the graveyard proper and what are called strangers. It's people who's, um, religious preferences aren't known to them. People um, sort of farm visitors to Belfast and clearly from the description we're not talking about dignitaries, we're talking about people who may have been press ganged into work as labour on ships or whatever else. Some of these people may get buried in that place. Um, one of the other interesting things about the court cases and what the genesis of the court case actually was was that there were bits of coffins and bones found in uh, Fickenage Park or gardens, or I think it's Fickenage Park, it's called, I don't know why it's gardens on the slide. Um, and they were dumped in the, uh, they, when they were de developing the street and some of these were used to infill places. So it is kind of given an idea of where if human remains turn up, that they're not, they're actually, you know, that they're out of context, they've been moved from somewhere else. But during the during the, the the court case, the prosecutor actually quotes Thomas Knowles' poem, "The Pauper's Drive." Um, Rattless bones over the stones. He's only a pauper who nobody owns, you know. And this is kind of like a, this is a, one of the points where they are going over some of these issues. Um, the that Rattless bones over the stones was also kind of a nursery rhyme. It had been a kind of chartist. Um, there was a chartist set of sort of an anthem that used it as well. I mean, it's kind of quite well known. And Joyce uses it, the refrain numerous times in Ulysses as well. Um, but I sort of was just digressing. I went looking for this, you know, burial site on the long bank, you know, 
So most of this lecture has just been a digression from what I was starting to talk about originally. Um, and I had eventually found in, in 1951, what was the Central Motor Auctions building on the corner of, uh, if you know where, uh, there's a, I think it's Granny Annie's is the name of the bar that's here. I'm like, I'm pretending I don't know. And that uh, there's just reference to work being done on some of the buildings there, and they discovered at the rear of the building uh, at least two different burials that were within kind of stone walls or, you know, like foundations or whatever there. Now, from what I can see, if you actually go and look, if you go down, um, if you go in Gloucester Street and you go up in, you can actually look into the, there's a gateway in behind it. That area is actually still open ground today. It meets all the criteria for being there, the site that's being referred to by Granger and Henry Purden. So it's possible that that is actually that location as well here. So I did actually find it in the end. Um, and I thought I was going to be even kind of bigger, smart, I like than usual. There's a mention the Queen's Anatomy Department were called out to look at human remains. Um, this, is, this is 1951. There are, are numerous occasions in the late 1940s, 50s, I think even 1960s, there are human remains turn up at sites where there's lots of building rubble, and they're clearly people who died in the Blitz, and their remains weren't recovered. Um, and so that they've, you know, like in, uh, over... Andale Embankment, I think there were two sets of remains found that are presumed from where the, the material had been dumped there that they were in, that they were people who died in the Blitz. There's a couple of other places in North Queen Street, um, corner Spamming Street, North Queen Street, there was an, at least one other. So um, um, it may gain us a layer of information or, you know, kind of it's relevant in this context. But uh, this, is not, this is not somewhere that this clearly from the description isn't what turned up here. Um, but the uh, even though, there, I mean, there was some blitz damage around this general area. But I, I think this is another this is another burial site in Belfast city centre. And, and it was the one that I actually started looking for originally. Um, so just to kind of sum up, like, I mean, I think there's, there's clearly a new layer of archaeological data here that's of significance to you know, to sort of understand the evolution of the town and aspects of the evolution of the town that there is kind of worth pursuing in a bit more detail. Um, I think like I mentioned in terms of the, the docks area, like this is presents heritage management challenges, obviously, because, you know, we don't actually know the physical footprint of any of these. You know, there's some that we know, like where the Corporation Church was in High Street and where the High Street burial ground was. We know there are burials in that vicinity and it's well documented. These other sites, we only know a little bit of information about a part of we, we don't really know the full extent of them. And they're not, it's not like a rural greenfield or a brownfield urban type site where we can go, okay, let's just open a big area and find it. Um, you, know, you know, it's going to be challenges to try and get the grips of what's actually there and retrieving information, even get an idea of date and what we're really dealing with. And Kind of one last point was I only looked at human remains. If you go and look at, um, if you look at some of the work that was done on Bronze Age metalwork from around Belfast, there's a huge number of stray finds from in around Belfast itself. Um, again, just because I'm familiar with the prehistoric metalwork, there's I mean there's a lot of gold finds, a lot of various things like that. I only looked at the burial information for burial information here. There are plenty of other finds from around the city centre. There's Lake Brown Sage Sword from Rosemary Street, you know, things like that. There's a lot of other layers of information there that may be possible to retrieve and pull out and add to what we know of the city and give us kind of an idea of all our areas that might be of archaeological interest. So that's, um, you know, I think that's the value in all of this is a complete accidental set of discoveries. But, uh, but just final thing, I just obviously like to thank everybody for inviting me along to speak. And if anybody wants a copy of the slides, if you write that down, the slides are on, you can just download them off the web. I've just put them up on that a bitly. I mean, it's just bit.ly forward slash UAS dry bones. I think you have to get the capital letters right in the last two. But um, but the, the slides are there. It's just if anybody needs them or wants them for anything, even just to look in more detail. Okay, well, I'll just leave it there. Okay, thanks.
much indeed. I say I don't think any of us will ever look at Belfast quite the same way as we walk around. Um, really, it's a bit of an eye opener for me, certainly. So um, before I do my sort of formal thanks, would anybody like to ask John any questions for this lecture? Yes, Rory. John, superb lecture, fantastic uh, interrogation of maps and pulling loads of different information together and interpreting it. Well done, it was fantastic. Um, out of curiosity, do you know what's, uh, or about the um, burials found at the Bastion? I always have heard that that was where Venables had stormed Belfast in 1649, around the North Gate. Is there? Uh, I, I looked for none of the accounts of that presented as being particularly bloody. Right. People later on do. There's an illustration, there's a line through a line illustration that's in, I think, is it in Ben or something like that, which kind of presents it as a sort of a bit, you know, brave hearty kind of, you know, with like lots of people kind of fighting. But the contemporary accounts don't, you know, nobody seems to make reference to lots of casualties or fatalities or anything. And like Buller's Field, there's another incident as well, you know, which would be on that side where the Great Patrick Street burial ground would be. But I mean, none of them seem to present it as being, you know, like there's a loss of life of any significance that it's even mentioned. So I, I suspect they're not, you know, they're not particularly bloody. And they think they, they grow later in significance as, you know, engage, military engagements. But I'm not really, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I just don't, I don't see there being like, I, I would expect somebody to be a bit more um, effusive about the loss of life, life as though there wasn't. Uh, John? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Uh, you mentioned Raymond's barn at the same time as BT Scott. Is it possible that Green's <coughs> barn is where Green Castle, maybe Green's Castle? Was which seemed to be at the west of Petey Scott. I, I think the Green where Greenmount. Uh, I think there's a Greenmount Street now where uh, the house was Greenmount, and I think I mean obviously that was Green's Mount, and I think Green's Barn is the same. You no, know, that's the place that McCormick is referencing where the the burials were put in along the foreshore there. But um, but I mean I think we've. Uh, I think there's probably a lot of potential for people to go in. If you go through Ben and the town book and various things, there are, are colloquial names for areas of Belfast that we've not systematically collected. And they may become quite significant and that they may be the little bit of information that joins up two or three things like that. And like Greens Barn was one. I mean, even in, in like the Bastion, is a, you know, it's as a, a, a it's place names lost in the city. The point feeds. If you ask someone where the point feeds are, they wouldn't have a clue. But on a lot of the early maps and things, there was a point loaning which ran out into the point feeds. And, you know, I mean, they were like a lot of those names are all lost now. But again, a better appreciation of them would probably help them form all our bits of information that we have and maybe transform something that we don't really know where this fits. <clears throat> I mean, Ringan's point is really interesting because even Jordan's survey maps, it moves where it's placed two or three times. So it's not really clear what Ringan's point actually refers to, when in one point it's somewhere out on the tidal flats and the other it's two different places along the foreshore. You know, so I mean, like that, that, you know, maybe, and maybe some of those are slightly more fugitive concepts because it's, you know, it's a name for a space rather than something very specific. Yes, Angela. Uh, you may have mentioned it, but I didn't quite hear. Do you have to report every finding to the police? Um, you, there are, uh, if, nowadays, if you if you encounter human remains and you're not expecting them to find them, it would be, you would obviously do that. Um, in another context, we actually were in touch with uh, PSNI over what, what is what their view is on Porton. Because if you're if you have an excavation license and you're carrying out an archaeological excavation, you get human remains. You don't expect, you know, what is the threshold for triggering contact with PSNI to advise them that you find human remains? Now, they've given us advice for that, which is guidance that's going to go to, you know, excav archaeological excavation directors. But I think normal practice is if you find human remains, I think in all cases you report it. If it's, if it's less than 
a hundred years old. I think is it is it a hundred years old for the Tissue Act now? Seventy five, something. Mm -hmm. Seventy five. Seventy five. Yeah. So I mean, if there, there's there's other issues that present depending on what's preserved, but I mean, normally. If you were on an archaeological excavation and you're in a medieval or prehistoric site and you find human remains, it's possibly what you would be expecting to find. But on an urban site, if you encounter human remains, I think, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, John, you can, can you hear me there? Hello? <clears throat> One question online. Yes. Just about um, Betty B's gut. What does gut mean? Uh, I. There's gut as a plate, I think, because I, I actually did try, I, I did my objection handling and tried to work out what this would be a while ago. Um, I found it in a number of different places where there's extensive slob lands, like intertidal estuarine flats, and it appears to be the channel in the estuarine flat, because I've seen it kind of used in Wexford and Cork, and there were kind of the big harbours there where there are, you know, those sort of flats. And that's what it seems to be. That's what the gut refers to. Um, I I don't know what the etymology of that would be. Um, <laughs> well, gut, gut or drain. Yeah, but you know, cut was what I thought. Well, yeah, what originally yeah. when I saw it, I thought it was typo, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And then when I kind of realised that it's, there are, there's a few of them, there's very, there's, there's only a handful of places that I've seen it used, but that seemed to be the commonality. That it's, uh, <laughs> and, and I think... By implication that it's you know it's only revealed a little tiny thing. Thank you. There's a it's what you said uh, channel and it also occurs as goat spelled G O T E and that comes up in Scottish names seemingly Scots. Um, and is that would, go, would that be like would, would that be any close to gate or you know like as an entrance? Is that what no. it's where you enter the estuarine flats? Seemingly go? not. It's, it's it, it, I mean, <laughs> place where it's a German word geese and goose uh, flow and it connects with that. There may or may not be a connection with the Irish word gui, which uh, not not the wind word. But the word that you get in the Donegal, we Salia, we Thor, and so on. But that may be something entirely different. I think it probably is, but it looks awfully similar. So yeah, well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a very difficult area. But there's definitely, <laughs> definitely um, words of like English, Scots, and you know, basically Germanic origin that mean something like a channel through. Slob land, as you said. Yeah. Well, that was I, I just when I tried to find other places that had it, that seemed to be what the common argument was. Mm -hmm. One significant place for that name is where the lagging navigation yeah. connects to Loch Ness at Ellis's. Ellis's Ellis 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 yeah. yeah. mm -hmm. So, soon they probably just picked a, just a channel that to Green connect Tree, to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah, and Green Island as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, they had a very, very narrow stream, it's the gut. And yeah. the to is shown. The mm -hmm. Any more questions, anybody? Just In that case, it just remains for me to thank John so much indeed on behalf of us all for a very thought-provoking lecture indeed. And certainly, uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of things to think about. Um, that's the same. Mm -hmm. We're walking through Belfast, just wondering exactly what it is we're walking over, indeed. So um, many thanks indeed, and just a little token of our appreciation. Thank you very much indeed. Tommy, so we have um, part from the, the uh, Ulster journals that people are. Uh, um, welcome to we have some of the fabulous archaeological calendars that we produced for the European Archaeological Association uh, Conference. They're free.